What a wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you very much. And I reckon you sort of saved me 27 seconds by going through my first two slides. Um, <laughs> This um, is a noise that I'm horribly familiar with. It's the sound of the UK Coast Guard requesting the launch of the Swanage lifeboat. That recording was just a few, uh, few weeks ago, actually. Um, and it's the start of a remarkable process, because roughly 10 minutes after that noise happens, a bunch of volunteers, six usually, will take a two and a half million pound boat out into what is uh, the very definition of a VUCA, you know, that volatile, uncertain, complex stuff, um, situation. Um, as the intro said, the people on that boat may not have worked in that configuration together. They certainly don't work together all the time. They're just volunteers. But there's an awfully high confidence um, in their team performance. And this talk, this short talk, it's just a little dive into the culture of making that rapid team performance happen. So the question is, do we in our organizational lives ever have to re uh, respond to crises? Because this is a talk about crises. This isn't a talk about the possible stuff or the probable stuff. This is, the, this is a talk about that long tail of events. You're the other way around, aren't you? That long tail of events. Um, that says something is going to happen, we just don't know what it is. So it's a rhetorical question, really. I think if you haven't had to respond to a crisis, then you probably will at some point. And my experience is that organizations don't usually prepare for those crisis events. But the RNLI does. And the RNLI does um, because that's what it exists to do, certainly the lifeboat, start, the lifeboat part of it. So if we don't prepare, how do we normally respond? Well, in my experience, we gather a load of people together, whether they're available or not, we cancel their training courses, we bring them in off leave, we do whatever it needs uh, to drag them in. Um, we lock them in a room, we feed them pizza, uh, we give them a motivational briefing that says something along the lines of, this better get fixed by Friday, otherwise we're all stuffed. Um, and then we sort of hope for the best. You know, we hope that the team performance is, um, is good enough to get a cracking outcome. Now, I think we can do better than that. And I started thinking about this in the context of what uh, me and other volunteers do with the RNLI. And I realized that whilst the RNLI and organizations do uh, traditional training, we have to learn how to drive the jet boat, we do have to learn how to interpret the radar picture, and so on and so on. Um, but what the RNLI does is beyond training. And we call it, we call it exercising, you know, the military heritage of a, an organization like the RNLI. Um, and it's all to do with complexity. So I'll have a quick show of hands, if I may. Who here has heard of Dave Snowden, the venerable, venerable Dave Snowden's Kinevan model? Quick show of hands. Well, fair few, fair few. Um, well, I haven't got anywhere near enough time to go into, into this model. Um, but suffice it to say that I, I believe that most organizational training occurs over on this side, this right-hand side of the, uh, of the model, of the domain model. Um, this is the sort of stuff where you go on a training course, you need an expert, so you pull in an expert, you go on a training course, you get a certification, uh, and it's all about a group of individuals or one individual acquiring some new skills. The RNLI pushes that training over into the complex side, over here. And it does it by doing two things. It does it by changing the focus from acquiring skills to the application of those skills to solve a real-life problem. 
So there are two things that push it over into the complex domain, really. One is that it involves a team, and it's not just about an individual or a small group. And the second is that it's uh, applied to a real-life scenario. Of course, the fact of the matter is that we're just team building, really, um, but with one sort of subtle difference. And that one difference, which is three bullet points, um, we don't know when we're going to need this particular team because the crisis hasn't happened yet. We don't know what we're going to need the team for because the crisis hasn't happened yet. And we don't really know who's going to be involved in solving the crisis again because the crisis hasn't happened yet. So how can we apply this sort of stuff, this sort of model, to what we do in our organizations. Well, I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes uh, to strip down one of these lifeboat exercises that we hold generally on a weekly basis and just sort of point out one or two things that I think organizations should, uh, certainly could try. First of all, who gets involved? Um, we exercise on a Wednesday evening and we never quite know who's going to turn up. We've got about 40 volunteers. Um, and we try and involve as many as we can. And we pick the crew that takes the boat out to see that night based on sort of maximum learning, usual sort of stuff. Now, organizations have a big advantage here because we've only got one boat. But in our organizations, we could put lots of crews together. We could put several crews together and let them run in parallel. So I think you should pick all the people that you're likely to ever want in a crisis as diverse as possible, marketing, HR, techies, management, whatever, uh, because you don't know what that crisis is going to be, so you don't know what skills you're going to need to solve it. But anybody you think may be useful, drag them together, form them into little crisis teams, crews if you like, Ask for their involvement. You don't want to force anything on them. Give them the capacity to do some work on the side. Ask them about it. Show an interest. Make it part of their job. How do you build them into a team? We've had some great talks this morning about teams, team building, um, and I'm not going to contradict any of those. Um, as a lifeboat crew, we have a fantastic identity. You know, we've got branded clothing and all sorts. Uh, we've got very defined roles, you know, they're very tangible roles. Um, and I don't think any of those things should go unnoticed and you should try to build those into the teams in your organisations if you possibly can. We have a strong social element. I wouldn't knock that either. Uh, and we have a lot of shared experiences. And shared experiences, the stronger the experience, the stronger the bond. All of those things can apply in your organisations too. I think you should help those teams with some enabling constraints. You know, they've got to know how much money they can spend. They've got to know uh, how long they can last together. They've got to know how much, uh, how much time they have to spend per week or whatever it might be in your organization. But help them form an identity, form their working practices and so on. And then what do you do with these potential crisis solving crews? Well, what we do is run scenarios. We make stuff up, and we run those scenarios, and we allow them to develop the way they go. Again, I think the organizations that we're all part of has got an advantage here in that it would be very easy to build your list of all that crud that you're never going to get around to fixing, but you quite like to. This is your organizational debt. It could be all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And this is your backlog. So what have we got? We've got a bunch of people who've been invited to work together. We've probably given them some new skills. We've given them some constraints to work within. And we've given them a backlog of problems. Maybe they've even created the backlog of problems. beginning to sound like a process. Now let it run. Let it evolve. 
Let them fail, let them learn. Encourage some emergence, encourage some innovation. And what are you likely to get out of that? Well, you'll certainly get richer social networks. You'll get some resilience because of that richer network. Somebody will know somebody who knows the person who knows the answer to the problem. And you'll have some preparedness, because remember, we're only preparing here. We're preparedness. We've got some greater preparedness for that crisis should it occur. Uh, people are more used to working with each other, etc., etc. Maybe you'll get some novel solutions to some of that organizational debt along the way, but that's not the point. The point is about the preparedness. Hopefully, the crisis teams you put together will never have to launch on a boat into the middle of a gale. Um, but if they do, I hope they have as much confidence in their teammates as I do on that boat with my teammates. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>